Welcome to episode 59 of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Eddard 15, A Game of Thrones. Uh, and in this episode we find that Ned Stark has been put on time out. He's been, he's been put in, in the naughty corner. Um, uh, and so he's spending some time alone to think about what he's done. He has a lot of time to think very carefully about every one of the horrific mistakes and strategic errors uh, which, uh, which led to his current position. It's always depressing to be faced with your errors inescapably. Often it's possible to sort of distract yourself, busy yourself, uh, and prevent yourself from having to contemplate the truly spectacular scale of your failures. But Ned Stark here, uh, I- inescapably, is faced with the extent of his fuck-ups, and he has a good long time to think about it. Uh, and the accommodations that he's in are not very pleasant. Uh, there's straw on the floor, and there's a stink of urine. There is not even a slop but bucket. So again, the classic Alt Swift X question is just begging to be asked. Where's he pooping? Where's he pooping? Someone's got to ask these questions. He hasn't got a slop bucket, so where's it going? You know, there isn't a window in this case, so the defenestration option, the classic defenestration option, uh, is not available to him. Um, where's he pooping? But he's in this cell, he's in the black cells of the Red Keep, uh, and he remembers being thrown in there uh, not so long ago. The door is four inches thick, apparently. Wood and studded with iron. Um so it doesn't look like getting out is something that he can do on his own. Uh, And the worst thing about the black cells of the Red Keep, there are a lot of bad things about the red cells of the Red Keep. Don't don't get me wrong. There's a lot of bad things about it. Uh, The lack of a slop bucket is pretty high up that list. Uh, But the fact that it's dark is the real problem. It is absolutely dark down here in the black cells. There is no light. So it's just complete blackness. You get no sensory stimulus. You just get void. Which is something that people pay for, uh, though, to be fair. You know, like uh, sensory deprivation chambers are a thing. You can you can pay to be put in this little pod uh, that's filled with, like, warm salt water and, like, the salt content, uh, the salt content of the... Uh, pod is the exact amount to like keep a person floating in the middle with like no no sense of like up or down or gravity so you're like totally immersed in like whoa where am i who am i and apparently you just trip balls apparently if you deprive uh if you deprive the mind of senses uh your 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 brain just just starts to generate new stuff it's like how you know in physics you know how in physics uh, a vacuum, like a true vacuum, doesn't really exist. And if you create a vacuum, the universe just fucking invents new particles to just be in there. Like these little temporary, just made up new... It's, it's, it's a thing, I'm sure. Someone in the comments can... Some physicist can tell us. Vacuums just invent more fucking particles, right? And in exactly the same way, when you, put, when you empty the mind, when, when you have no stimulus in the mind... The mind just has to make up new shit, new stimulus. Your mind just imagines stuff, you know? Um, and apparently it's crazy. So Ned is kind of getting that by ble- by being down in the black cells. Uh, but thank you, Noah Warnock, for your kind donation, Noah. Uh, we will answer all uh, comments and stuff from donations at the end of the stream, I think is the new way of doing things. Thank you, Noah. Uh, and so he's in his little sensory deprivation cell, uh, and, uh, and Ned's not really enjoying it. Uh, and he's thinking about, he's thinking about the gravity of his fuck-ups. Uh, indeed, Brandon Winslow, uh, Ned thinks, ah, Robert. So Robert Baratheon is the reason that Ned Stark came south. If it wasn't for Rob, Rob Baratheon, Ned would still be sitting in Winterfell. 
If it wasn't for Robert Baratheon, the bloody Targaryens would still be in charge. Robert Baratheon is kind of the ultimate cause of all of this stuff. Uh, but, you know, forgive him, Ned, for he knows not what he does. Robert Baratheon, is, he's just Bobby B. He hits things with his hammer. Should, should he really be to blame? And yet he was the king. He purportedly was the person in charge with the authority. So perhaps uh, some blame uh, is, is Bobby's to bear. Uh, and by the way, Ned's leg is still hurting. Uh, he, Ned still had that horsey fall on his leg, and he hasn't had a lot of time to heal his leg. He's sort of got other things to do. He hasn't really got the time to sit around and uh, recuperate, uh, because his leg is, is, he's got all this political stuff going on, but his leg is shattered still, uh, which is a problem. Uh, and, uh, and spoiler, his leg will never fully heal. Isn't that depressing? Wouldn't it suck to die and still have, like, injuries? Like, wouldn't it suck to die with, like, a cut, or, like, a cold, or, like, some kind, something that would otherwise heal and go away, but to die with that? Uh, that's, that's just embarrassing, I think. Um, but anyway, so, Ned thinks about Robert, uh, and he thinks that, you know, Robert always used to say, the king eats and the hand takes the shit, which, by the way can be interpreted in a bunch of different ways. Uh, we're getting a bit scatological here on the old Swift X show, um, but, but, but it's an interesting phrase, uh, the king eats and the hand takes the shit. Uh, because does that mean, the hand takes the shit, that can be interpreted two ways. Does that mean that they take the shit, like, in their hand to deal with? Like the, like the hand takes the shit into their hand to dispose of or to, or to do something with? Or... Do they take the shit in the sense of taking a shit, as in they are abluting, ex, 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 extruding? They are doing, they are doing the poop. Is that what that means? Because it could kind of go either way, couldn't it? And both of them kind of work within the metaphor, uh, because in both senses, the hand is sort of like doing the dirty work, right? Uh, but yeah, in the show, they change it again. In the show. Uh, as Kelly says, uh, they say the hand wipes instead. They take the shit, which I think does sound better, doesn't it? But yes, let's not over over analyze the metaphor. So Ned is thinking about Rob, um, and uh, he's in the he's in the Red Keep dungeon, and he reflects on the little factoid that apparently um, that apparently Magor the Cruel, King Magor, uh, many many years ago. Uh, murdered all of the masons who built this castle, who built the Red Keep, and he did it so that he could keep the secrets of the keep. Because, of course, there are many secret passageways and secret tunnels and secret secret ways uh, um, um, around the Red Keep, which only uh, a select few individuals know how to navigate. So Varus is one of the only people who knows about the secret passageways around the Red Keep. Um, and, and, and that's because Magor killed the Masons. Although, of course, at this point, it's not really, it's not really acting in the monarchy's benefit, these secret passages. The problem with some, some kind of top secret secret passage is that if the kings in charge forget about where they all are, you end up with a situation where people like Varys are the only people who control it. Uh, and so, you know, the Baratheon dynasty, such, it, uh, such as it is, is not exactly benefited by these passageways. Varys uh, uses them to undermine the crown's authority, to free people like Tyrion, and to come and visit people like Ned. Although, although Varys uh, visits Ned through another, through another uh, sneaky, sneaky uh, uh, play, which we'll see shortly. Um, and Ned sits, and Ned damns them all. Littlefinger, Janos, Slint, so those two in particular are kind of the ones who screwed Ned over uh, by lying to him about the whole sort of supposed bribery to get the gold cloaks on side. Uh, and also Cersei and Jamie and Pycelle and Varys and Barristan and Renly. Ned also damns for their complicity in, in, in Joffrey taking over and Ned's imprisonment. None of these people, none of these powerful people, none of these supposedly honourable people stood up for Ned, and stood up for the king's words. Everyone saw Cersei rip up King Robert's will, uh, and none of them did anything. So that's a bit fucked up. Uh, uh, and yes, Diego, so Varys takes on the identity of Rugen when he visits here, so we'll see that. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. So Cersei Lannister, 
Yeah, but most of all, Ned damns himself. He calls himself a fool, a thrice, dr- a thrice damned blind fool, because of course it was Ned's terrible decision making that that allowed him to be swindled by Peter and by uh, and by General Slint. Uh, and then Cersei seems to float before him in the darkness. So Ned's getting some mad sensory deprivation hallucinations. Uh, and he imagines Cersei mocking him. Um, and and uh, and he thinks, and Ned thinks about how Ned's own mistakes uh, were paid for by his men. His men paid with, his li- with their lives for Ned's folly, which again is one of the constant themes uh, in, in Game of Thrones, which is, the, which is when the lords play their Game of Thrones. It's the innocents who die, and we'll get a quote about that shortly. Uh, and he thinks about his daughters, Sansa and Arya. That's what Ned's really uh, sad about. Uh, a real top bloke like Ned, he isn't scared for himself. He's scared for those who he protects and those who he loves. Uh, and so he, he wants to cry about Sansa and Arya and the bad situation that he's put them both in. Uh, But uh, he's a Stark of Winterfell, and so his grief and rage freezes hard inside him. Uh, So it's it's, it's almost a a traditional Stark uh, characteristic to be emotionally uh, 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 non-expressive to be masculine and tough and stoic. Stoic's the word to describe it. They don't like, uh, they just like to deal and carry on with their responsibilities and don't let their emotions screw with them. That is the Starkian response, apparently. Um, it sounds a bit inhuman, doesn't it? It seems to me that, that the others, the White Walkers, might be described as... Um, as having as having their their emotions frozen hard inside them, it's almost as if you put a Stark in one of the ice cells for long enough. Do you think they'd freeze into a White Walker with no emotions at all? Although the the White Walkers do seem to have some uh, some emotion because they laugh uh, when they kill uh, Waymar in the prologue. So it's not like they're totally inhuman. Uh, Bill Brasky, by the way, uh, asks about the prevalence of swords over other weapons, like maces and axes and spears and stuff. Because apparently uh, combat in Westeros is very different to combat in medieval Europe, real medieval Europe. Uh, For one thing, yeah, everyone's got bloody swords instead of other weapons. Um, There's a preponderance of uh, full armor as well, apparently, in certain situations. And and also some of the terminology is different. Alt Shift X got... Um, got 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 hammered by the uh, by the sword, the sword sticklers, uh, the sword fanciers. Because uh, apparently the term longsword uh, in the real world means what you'd think it should mean, which is a really long sword, like a great sword, a two-handed sword. Uh, whereas in a Game of Thrones in Westeros, a longsword is actually a, a, what you might imagine is like a normal-sized sword, a shorter sword. Uh, and so in the Valyrian Steel video, Alt Shift X, uh, uh, there was some talk of long swords, which was technically incorrect in the real world sense, because George Martin, for some reason, decided to just decide that a long sword is actually something shorter. He changed the terminology, and he does indeed change uh, the the sword, the sword, swordy, pointy stuff. Uh, but 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 BS. Yes. In answer to the question, I think the reason why there are so many swords is because um. Swords are cool, mate. Swords are cool. Uh, every, every young boy wants to grow up to be a knight with a with a with a sword, like King Arthur. King Arthur didn't have a mace. King Arthur didn't have a spear. Swords are just the cooler weapon, and so I think that's why Westeros is full of them. At the end of the day, George R. R. Martin. I mean, you've seen all of these little toys, right? Like George Martin's office is full of like these little knight toys and these little castle dioramas and stuff. At, at the end of the day, deep down, I think George Martin is, a, is an eight-year-old boy who just loves just knights and swords and horses and, and he just loves that whole feel. Um, and, um, and I think that's why there's so many swords. Um, yeah, Adam. So, yeah, Freud would probably say that swords are penises, although you'd think that he would think that, like, spears are even more phallic. So, you know, I, I, like, there are more phallic weapons than the sword. So I don't think it's just that Freudianism. 
going on. Anyway, let's not talk about Freud. Uh, so Ned is in an uncomfortable situation. Uh, the accommodation uh, is uncomfortable. Uh, he will be rating this very low on Airbnb um, because because the decor is terrible. The feng shui is all off. Uh, there's no slop bucket, and it smells like piss. Um, and he. And, and since he's deprived of the sun or the moon or any kind of stimulus, he can't tell if it's night or day. So he's just in this trancey, vague, whoa, like tripped out. He's in a sensory deprivation tank. Um, and he's he's somewhere in between sleeping and waking. He sleeps and wakes and he doesn't know what time it is. Uh, and when he sleeps, he has disturbing dreams of blood and broken promises, uh, which evokes the whole sort of Leanna Stark situation, promise me that thing. Though it's very interesting, the term broken promises. Because as far as we know, like if presumably the promise that Ned made to Leanna was to keep Jon Snow safe uh, and to pretend that he's Ned's bastard, uh, it seems as though Ned kept that promise, right? Um, but, but, but here he mentions broken promises. So what promises has Ned Stark broken? Maybe you could say, uh, that, like, Ned's promise to Robert to protect his children might, might be it. Uh, because he does fail to do that, given given with how he managed to get himself killed, so perhaps that's the broken promise. But he also thinks about his wife, Catelyn, which is a painful thought to think what she's up to. He wonders if he will ever see her again, and sadly he does not. Uh, and it's apparently been days, or maybe just hours in here, he's not really sure, uh, and he tries to keep himself sane, so he talks aloud. Um, he, he talks to himself... Uh, and he's thinking about what's going on politically, and he's hoping that he'll get released somehow. Uh, so he's figuring that, well, Catelyn will raise the North. Uh, he doesn't think Rob will, he thinks Catelyn will. Um, and uh, he thinks that the, that the Vale uh, and the River Lords will join her, the Vale does not, because Lysa is so defensive. Uh, and he thinks of Robert's brothers, Renly and Stannis, gathering armies, uh, but it doesn't occur to Ned that they will use those armies against each other. Because remember, it's so ridiculous, that whole Renly claim thing, where Renly decides that he wants to be king even though he's the younger brother. Like, you can't do that. That's not how the rules work. And the way that Renly and Stannis wasted their resources against each other was so... Yeah, damaging to both of their causes. If they joined forces and just went on to King's Landing straight away, while Tywin was busy in the Westlands and the Riverlands, Stannis could have bloody taken over King's Landing, probably. Um, but because of Renly's stupidity, it didn't happen. Um, and Ned thinks of what Robert was like back in the day, when he was a young man, um, strong and powerful. Um, and he imagines Robert saying, Ned, how did it come to this? How did it come to this? We were, we were once so young and strong, and now, uh, now you're in a, in a cell, and I've been killed by a pig. Uh, this is, <laughs> this is not what these two had in mind. Because remember, when these guys, were, when these guys were young 20 years ago, uh, they had just taken over the bloody continent together, uh, they'd put they'd put Robert in charge of the throne, and they had all these great ideas about how everything's going to be great from now on. So we've gotten rid of the nasty Targaryens, uh, and 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 Robert is going to rule wisely, and Ned Stark's going to be his main man, and it's all going to be great. But in quite a rapid, uh, quite a rapid pace, everything turned to shit. Um, so they so they commiserate. How did it come to this? Uh, and then uh, Ned also has a vision of Littlefinger mocking him. And, of course, Littlefinger had a lot to do with why uh, everything went downhill. Uh, so Ned is feverish. Um, he's he's thirsty. He's hungry. And then a jailer comes in and gives him some water. Uh, and uh, Ned asks questions about what's going on with his daughters. His main selfless concern is the uh, welfare of his daughters, um, but the jailer refuses to answer questions, gives him the water, and leaves. Um, and so Ned sinks sinks to his knees uh, and, and thinks that it no longer stinks of urine and shit in here, it no longer smells at all. Uh, so has Ned suddenly mysteriously lost his sense of smell? No. Uh, the meaning is that Ned is so distraught uh, by the situation that he and, and specifically his daughters are in that uh, the world 
just loses its fucking corporeal, material sense of realness, I think is what's going on here. Ned is so aggrieved uh, by by how effed up everything is uh, that, that nothing even feels real anymore. He cannot even smell the stank anymore, is how is how devastated Ned is feeling. Um, and he can no longer tell the difference between waking and sleeping. He, he, this is sort of like a tripping montage. Remember, uh, it was like a vision quest. Remember, um, it's like fucking Daenerys in The Great Grass Sea. It's like Homer in that one episode where he trips on... Was it on Chili? What's, the, the, the really great episode where Homer has like the vision quest and he's like tripping balls... What 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 caused that vision quest? Was it the was that the chili episode or is that two different episodes? But whatever it is, uh, so Ned's Ned's tripping, um, and he has a vision of the of the tourney at Harrenhal, the tourney of Harrenhal, which was one of the most important events uh, in Westeros history, the big party uh, where a whole bunch of stuff went down. Um, yeah, see, we're no longer swearing. We're, we're a family-friendly show now. We're gonna say gosh, we're gonna say darn, maybe, if we're feeling really edgy, but otherwise, we wouldn't want to say any, uh, rude words. Ever. Ever. Anyway. Uh, and so he's imagining the tourney at Harrenhal. So this was a tournament, uh, when King Aerys was king, uh, and this is to be the tournament where, uh, Rhaegar crowns Lyanna as his Queen of Love and Beauty, which leads to Robert Baratheon, um, to Robert's, uh, rebellion. So some of the people there include Brandon's older, uh, Edda's older brother Brandon, uh, and Robert, who was fighting like a madman in the melee, uh, and, uh, he imagines Jamie Lannister when he was really young, and King Aerys was there, uh, and Jamie was inducted into the Kingsguard, and Gerald Hightower, uh, the White Bull was there, and of course Gerald Hightower is later killed by Ned and his friends at the Tower of Joy, uh, and Rhaegar Targaryen. Above all these impressive people was the one who really dominated. Uh, he, he, he beat everyone in the jousting. Um, fiddlesticks. Fiddlesticks indeed, Stephanie. That's the sort of word we'll be using in the future. Um, we're not like Kendrick Lamar with that filthy word written in Times New Roman across his album art. Uh, we, only use, we only use clean language here. A Christian server indeed. Um, and... Uh, and Rhaegar beat Sir Barristan in the final joust and then went and crowned Lyanna. The moment when all the smiles died. And we learn later in Barristan's POV that Barristan feels a lot of guilt over his defeat in the joust because uh, of how uh, it led to Robert's rebellion in many ways, because Rhaegar was able to crown Lyanna. Um, and B- Barristan feels that if only he'd been a better jouster and beaten Rhaegar, he might have averted this whole chain of events. The Targaryens might still be in charge. Robert's Rebellion might never have happened. All these people will still be alive. Uh, and he'd be married with Ashara, skipping through a meadow, going la di la di da um, That's the sort of thing that Barristan imagines. Perhaps not realistically. But a lot of people have a lot of uh, memories and guilts and thoughts about what went down at the tourney of Harrenhal. Um, and... Ned, uh, Ned imagines thorns and blood and winter roses, uh, so we get all these trippy emotional visions surrounding the, the moment that the smiles died, and he hears, promise me, Ned, promise me, Ned, uh, which seems to be the promise when Ned promised Lyanna to look after Jon Snow for her. Um, and so Ned is, Ned is weeping now, and Ned, so Ned's, Ned's vision quest is, uh, taking a dark turn, uh, and he thinks, I'm going mad, and the gods did not deign to answer. The gods are funny in Game of Thrones. The gods are funny. People often make, make appeals to the gods in Game of Thrones, and almost always the sort of narrative voice of the book. Not so much the characters as, as the narrative voice sort of tells us, but the gods in the end were cunts. Uh, you know, Cersei reached out to Arya, they did the, and then he spoke out, and then, but then the god said no. Computer says no. God, god denies your request. 
uh, uh, God takes your feedback. Uh, we, your feedback is important to us. God will consider your complaint in our customer service division, uh, and, and 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 will take your feedback into account for future for future future apocalypses. You know, the gods just don't really seem to care. Uh, in Game of Thrones. Although, of course, they do sort of seem to exist, or at least have some sort of power or influence, because we saw, because we see, like, R'hllor fucking resurrecting people, supposedly. Probably not, like, an actual person god. Like, let's be honest, R'hllor is probably not, like, a bloke with a beard. Uh, but, there, but there does seem to be some kind of force that, that seems to respond to certain kinds of rituals and certain kinds of, you know, at least, at least they're pretty into blood uh, and stuff. So the gods do seem to be real in some sense. But they do not seem to be uh, out to help Ned in this particular situation. Um, and so the turnkey brings him some water, uh, and he's so he's not too thirsty, but he is feeling very hungry because they're not feeding him. Uh, so it occurs to him that uh, Cersei then, who's presumably running this show, uh, doesn't want him to die because they keep feeding uh, him water, but they're not giving him food, so they want him weak. Um, and he speculates that the reason why she doesn't want him killed is because Catelyn still has Tyrion, Ned thinks. Uh, so, so the main sort of card that they have here is the hope of some kind of hostage swap between Ned and Tyrion. Um, and, uh, yeah, because, because they figure if that Cersei kills Ned, then Catelyn will kill Tyrion. So, uh, Ned is hoping that Tyrion will keep him alive, but, but sadly, um, sadly... Uh, they no longer have Tyrion. You can hear a beard? Is that a thing? What do you mean you can hear a beard? Hairless Oyster has oyster superpowers, seafood superpowers. He's like Aquaman. You're like Aquaman, Hairless Oyster. Uh, anyway, so, um, so a new jailer comes in. Uh, and this is the gentleman known to, uh, known to some as Rugen, but known to us as Varus. Um... So Varus in the books has like powers of like disguise and transformation. He's like uh, Mystique in X Men, right? He can just fucking magically uh, change his appearance uh, through mummery powers. Um, so, like, uh, Varys grew up with a bunch of actors, and so he learned how to disguise himself, how to wear props, uh, props even more sophisticated than, you know, the classic glasses plus fake nose plus moustache? Varys's uh, costumes are even more elaborate than that. So, in this case, uh, uh, he's got a fake dark stubble of beard, and he's got these different clothes, and he smells of sweat and sour wine. So Varus has changed his appearance and his odour and all these aspects of his uh, person in order to take on the identity, not of Varus, but of the jailer Rugen. And this is how Varus is able to enter the cells undetected, and it's how he's able to later free Tyrion, though he chooses not to free Ned. Um, and Ned brings some wine, uh, and Ned at first is like, oh, is this poison? Are you gonna, are you gonna poison me, mate? Um, and, uh, Varys is like, oh, come on, mate, would, you can trust me. You can trust me. <laughs> I wouldn't poison you. You're the last person I'd poison. Truly, no one loves a eunuch, he complains. Though, of course, let's be real. It's not just because Varys is a eunuch that people don't trust him. It's certainly part of it. But if Varys had a, had, had a cock, people still would be untrusting of him, I think. Um, the chat seems to have disappeared from the uh, stream uh, video, which is odd. Uh, perhaps it'll return. Who knows? It's a fickle, it's a fickle beast. Uh, but um, be unconcerned, the chat is still on the side. Anyway, so um, he drinks the wine after Varys demonstrates that it's not poisoned, um, and he complains that the wine is, is a bit sour, uh, and then Varys says, all men must swallow the sour with the sweet. Phrasing. Um, and, he to and Ned asks about his daughters, and so then Ned finally gets some news. About his about his daughters, he hears uh, that the younger girl Arya has has fled, uh, and he hears that Sansa is captured by the Lannisters and is still betrothed to Joffrey. Um, and so uh, Ned is glad to hear some news about his daughters. Uh, and then Varys tells Ned that I trust that you I trust you know that you are a dead man, um, which is hyperbole, as we learn later. Varys 
Varys believes that there's still an opportunity for Var- for Ned to survive, as there still is at this point in the plot. Um, and Ned's like, "Oh, look, I- I'm 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 cool. I'm chill. I'm not even worried." at all, because Catelyn has Tyrion, so therefore Cersei won't kill me. Uh, but then Varys gives the sad news uh, that Cersei no longer ha- uh, that Catelyn no longer has Tyrion. So then Ned's like, wow, I really am fucked. Just slip my throat right here and now. Um, uh, and it's also interesting that Varys says, uh, well, yes, Catelyn had a Lannister brother, but she had the wrong Lannister brother. So the implication is that if Catelyn had Jaime, uh, then the whole hostage situation will be taken seriously, but not uh, if he just has Tyrion, because Tyrion is the less valuable Lannister, in Tywin's eyes at least. Uh, maybe Tywin would relish the opportunity to get Tyrion killed somehow. Uh, maybe maybe uh, Tywin would just deliberately provoke Catelyn into killing Tyrion as a way of getting rid of Tyrion. Uh, it's unclear if Tywin has ever directly attempted to murder Tyrion. You'd think he pretty easily could if he wanted to. Uh, but Tywin certainly does do things like put Tyrion on the front lines of battle um, with his mountain clansmen, uh, which does seem to have been, uh, at, at least to some extent, an attempt to get Tyrion killed. So Tywin would like Tyrion dead, it seems. Uh, so maybe Tyrion isn't so valuable as a hostage to the Starks. Um, and... Uh, but Varys expresses a desire to keep Ned alive. Um, and Ned complains that, well, if you wanted me alive, why didn't you do something when I was being attacked and my blokes were being killed? And Varys was like, I'm an unarmed eunuch. Like, what am I going to do? Heroically fight my way to save you. What What do you expect, mate? Um, and, and then Varys talks a bit about how uh, in his past as an actor, he learned that everyone has a role to play. Uh, and as the Master of Whisperers, my role is to be sly and obsequious and without scruple. Uh, so Varys acknowledges that he, that, he, that he plays the role, that he plays a character, almost, as Varys. Because, uh, of course, half the things that he says in this book that we see him saying are for the benefit of the audience, uh, which is like the small council and the court. Like, most of what Varys says in this series, he doesn't actually believe. Uh, he's playing the role of the spider, when his real goals are something else. Uh, and in a certain Old Chief X video, you can learn about uh, his connections to the whole Blackfire conspiracy, which seems to be his real motivation. Um, and so Ned studies the eunuch's face, searching for truth behind the mummer's scars and false stubble. Um, and Ned's like, can you free me? And, Ned, and Varys is like, yeah, I could free you, but will I? No. Uh, because uh, the reason Varys gives here is that if Varys freed Ned, uh, then people would ask questions and people would eventually figure out that it was Rugen and therefore Varys who was responsible. Uh, and whether that's true is a fair question. Uh, would Varys really get found out if he freed Ned? It certainly would be risky, you'd imagine, and maybe Varys just figures uh, Ned isn't worth the risk. Um, in the case of Tyrion, of course, Varys fled King's Landing after freeing Tyrion. Uh, so, you know, he didn't want to take the risk of getting caught or getting found out. So supposedly, presumably, there is some degree of risk involved. Um, and Ned says, wow, so you're really just telling me you could free me, but you're just going to leave me to rot in here. That's that's pretty cold, Varys. Coming from a Stark, coming from a man whose heart was just described as ice, that is stone cold, my friend, my cockless friend. That is, wow, you you, you really, wow. Uh, but then Varys says, well, a eunuch has no honour, and a spider does not enjoy the luxury of scruples, my lord. Varys has all of the best dialogue in this bloody book. It's amazing. Um, and and Varys also says that, well, you know, and I also could deliver a message for you um, if I decide that the message serves my ends and my purposes. And so Varys says, well, what ends are those? What even is your goal? Like, what are you even about, mate? I don't even get you. You're an enigma wrapped in a pickle, stacked into a leaning tower of puzzles. Um, you're like a big Jenga tower made of jigsaw pieces. You're like a game of Clue where all of the pieces are SpaghettiOs. Like, I just can't even begin to understand. What is you? Ned says. Uh, and Varys says, well, look, it's quite simple. All I want is peace. I want the king, Robert Baratheon, to be alive. I want the politics to be stable. I've been protecting Robert Stark, Robert Baratheon, for decades. Uh, I could protect him from his enemies, but it seems 
I could not protect him from his friends. And so Varys uh, says that it's pretty much Ned's fault that Robert is dead because Ned told Cersei that Ned knew about the bastardy of Joffrey and the incest and all that. Um, and it's because of that that Cersei chose to kill uh, Robert because she was afraid that Ned was going to tell Robert, which which he planned to. Uh, so in, in a way, uh, Ned forced Cersei's hand and forced her to kill Robert. Um uh, and, and yeah, so Varys also talks, uh, directly implicating Cersei in the death of Robert, with what with the wine and the hunting and all of that, and Lancel. Uh, and so Varys says, it was not wine that killed the king, it was your mercy. Uh, and, so, and so Ned thinks, gods forgive me, and Varys says, I expect they will. <laughs> uh, which, yeah, again, it's probably true, because Ned, for all of his fuck-ups... Um, is pretty difficult to blame. Ned has always at least tried to do the right thing. Ned's kind of... He he is dumb, but but he always had good intentions. And if the gods judge on the basis of good intentions, uh, then, then he will be judged well. Heaven would be full of people who, with, with, with good intentions but poor execution, wouldn't it? I mean, depending on the criteria. I don't know how St. Peter at the pearly gates, you know, I don't know what his marking rubric is, but, but if it's based on intentions, then, then heaven would be full of all these people who tried their very best, but, but were ultimately ineffectual. I, I think, I think probably the most impactful people, the people who change the world, are the people who have to make moral compromises. I mean, that's one of the themes of this book, about how power uh, is, a, is, a, is a tricksy beast, and often you've got to, you've got to sort of smooth over some ethical concerns in order to get shit done. Um, I think that's true of the real world. So, I mean, heaven would be full of all these, you know, well-intentioned but ineffectual people, uh, and down in purgatory and hell, I think you might find the people who really influence the world, the people who are willing uh, to to screw people over in the name of a, of some higher good. Um, so those people would keep company with the truly deranged. Be an interesting place, heaven and hell. It'd be, um, there'd be a lot of good conversations up there. You'd have, like, Socrates just kicking it back with, like, uh, Steve Jobs uh, and um, and Bodicea. Wouldn't that be a great conversation? That'd be fascinating. Um, but it would, it would start to get tedious towards the end, wouldn't it? After the first 20 million years. Anyway, um, so... Uh, so they talk about how Ned fucked up. This is basically one big old chapter of, Hey, Ned... You fucked up. That's the title of this chapter. Um, and uh, Varys says that tomorrow Cersei is going to visit you. Uh, and uh, Varys talks about Cersei's political situation, about how Tywin and Jaime are off busy fighting the River Lords. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the Martells pose a potential threat, the Arons pose a potential threat, and now the North poses a potential threat because Rob Stark is marching an army south. So Cersei's scared. Cersei's scared of all of these threats. Uh, and ultimately, she wants Ned on side. She wants Ned to be an ally. Uh, she doesn't want to have to kill him. She wants to use Ned as a way of preventing Rob Stark from invading. Uh, and um, and Varys talks a bit about Stannis and how Stannis is utterly without mercy. There is no creature on Earth half so terrifying as a truly just man. Stannis Stannis follows by the by the rule book, and the rule book in Westeros involves an awful lot of execution. Um, Robert was always very merciful, willing to bend the rules. Stannis is not, uh, and for that he is terrifying. Um, and uh, Stannis poses a threat. Uh, Cersei's worried that Stannis will land with an army and cut off Joffrey's head, and Varys expresses that he truly believes that Cersei cares more about Joffrey's life than her own life. There's a lot of different ways to interpret Cersei's relationship with her children. Like, is she truly that concerned about them, or is she only concerned about them to the extent that they sort of represent herself? Is it just sort of a narcissistic love? Is it a real love? Should love even be a dick measuring contest? Should we say that one person's love is more legitimate than another's? Uh, well, there, there is that one lady who loves a Ferris wheel. Have you seen that YouTube video of the lady who fell in love with a Ferris wheel and I think she got legally married to it? Or uh, So, you know, th there's some argument there that some people's love is left less legitimate than others, but hey, don't knock it till you try it, perhaps. Um, and so, uh, Varys is like, so you have a chance to stay alive here. 
if you play by the rules, if you stick with, uh, if you stick with Cersei, if you become a tame wolf, you will be more useful to Cersei than a dead wolf. Uh, so if you just play along and pacify your son, uh, you could restore stability and peace. You could you could buy Cersei the time she needs uh, in order to fortify against Stannis if she doesn't have to worry about the Starks, uh, and everything can all be chill and and you can live. And Ned is appalled, of course. Ned 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 always finds it within himself to be shocked uh, by by the Machiavellian schemings of of Varys and Co. Uh, he's like, you really want me to serve the woman who who crippled my son and murdered my king. Um, but Varys says, well, you know, you got to be sly and obsequious, my man, my dude. Um, I want you to serve the realm, Varys says. It is in the realm's best interests. If you support Joffrey and support Cersei uh, and keep their secret about the incest, um, and if you do that, then they'll let you live. They'll, they'll probably send you up to the wall where you can just hang out with Benjen and Jon Snow for the rest of your days. Wouldn't that be a, a nice alternate reality where Ned Stark survives and goes and hangs out with Benji and Jono up at the wall? Uh, and and Ned thinks about Jon, which fills him with a sense of shame and sorrow, and he thinks if only he could see Jon again and sit and talk with him. What would that conversation be like if Ned could talk with Jon again? What kind of secrets would Ned reveal to Jon? That would be fascinating. Uh, and Varys is like, look, but for, for real, like, uh, like Ned is like, for real, like, who, who, who do you serve, Varys? Whose team are you on? Like, what do you, like, you say you serve the realm, but like, what does that even mean? Like, whose side are you on? Are you working with Littlefinger? Uh, and Varys is like, no, 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 not that, not Littlefinger. I would sooner wed the black goat of Kohor than be in league with Littlefinger. Littlefinger's the last person. Who Varys would be on a team with. Uh, Varys calls Littlefinger the second most devious man in the seven in the Seven Kingdoms, and Varys apparently uh, convinces Littlefinger that Varys is on his side, um, but he's not really. Uh, although, of course, I don't think Littlefinger is as uh, is wrapped around Varys as Littlefinger uh, to the extent that Varys seems to think Peter is. Uh, Littlefinger, I think, might be a bit smarter than Varys even realises. Um, and again, so Varys just says, look, the, the person who I truly serve is the realm. I serve the realm, and the realm needs peace. And of course, all of that is very questionable, because Varys does, you know, uh, support a Targaryen conspiracy to invade and conquer Westeros, you know, uh, which is kind of the opposite of peace. You know, war, the opposite of peace. Just like, just like Tolstoy would tell you, war is the opposite of peace. Um, so, so it's questionable whether Varys truly does serve the realm in the way that he claims. Um, and and Ned's like, look, fuck it. Look, I I'm too honourable. I'm gonna follow the rules, my code of ethics. I don't want to do this bullshit. Um, I I, I don't want to pretend to support. Joffrey and Cersei is strong and I won't do it. My life is not worth that dishonor. So Ned says quite, quite clearly that he'd rather die than be dishonorable. Um, but then Varys says, well, but what about your daughter's life? Don't you care about Sansa? Because she's fucked if you let yourself die. Um, what about Sansa? And then Ned really kind of starts to break there. He really starts to break down uh, when he's reminded that, yeah, his daughter is caught up in the middle of all this. His daughter is the pawn in this terrible game. And he says, please leave my daughter out of this. And then Varys says, well, look, welcome to life. The children get hurt too in the Game of Thrones. He talks about Rhaenys Targaryen. Rhaegar's daughter, who was who was murdered during Robert's Rebellion. Robert's Rebellion, which Ned was a part of. So Varys is reproaching Ned by saying that, well, your actions have led to the death of children too, uh, so you're not one to talk. Uh, and they also mention Rhaenys's black kitten called Beleriion, uh, who is probably the most important, important kitten in the series after Sir Pounce. Um... And, and Varys sighs, the sigh of a man who carries all the sadness of the world upon his shoulders, like Atlas. Varys is like an Atlas without balls. Um, and, and Varys says that, you know, some people say that as we sin, so do we suffer. But why is it that when the High Lords play the Game of Thrones, it's always the innocents who suffer most? And again, Varys can hardly really talk here, can he? Because Varys takes orphan children removes their tongues to make them mute, 
and uses them as spies in his secret little spy cabal. Varus hurts innocent people as well. So, so even now, when we're supposedly seeing the real Varus, who is the real Mitt Romney? When we're seeing the real Varus, even then, he's playing a role. Even then, he's lying. Even now, uh, what we're seeing is not the true Varus. Will we ever see the real Varus, the real Mitt Romney? Who knows? He's, he, he's a family man. He's... All right. Um, and, so, and so the chapter ends with Varus telling Ned that, you know what, this all comes down to your choice. Whether you want Sansa to survive, whether you want the realm to, to be peaceful or full of war, the choice is up to you. And Varys is recommending that Ned confess the treason that he didn't commit and support Joffrey and Ned and live. That is the course of action that Varys suggests. Although, of course, none of that ever comes to pass, does it? Um, because of the impulsiveness of Joffrey and his decision to just execute Ned, because of that, all of this talk of confession and survival ends up uh, ends up being moot. Um, so in the end, Ned's choice didn't didn't really come into it. Uh, thank you for the donation, uh, Riley Roo. Um, bonus points if I say your name right, Riley Roo. Riley Ra Ra Riley Ra. Gotta love the alliteration. Uh, but anyway, so this chapter is about is, is is kind of about Ned and how the whole idea that being ethical and being a good bloke sometimes won't get you anywhere. Uh, sometimes you've got to be sly and obsequious and unethical, uh, and that the world is unjust and power is unjust. Innocent people get screwed over, um, uh, and the innocents die when we play the Game of Thrones. Uh, and we'll see the full consequences of this born out later. At this point, there still seems to be some hope. At this point, the reader's still thinking, oh, Sean Bean, he's a good boy. He'll survive. He's the hero. He'll save the day from the White Walkers. Um, we, we haven't yet had the crushing realisation that this is a series that will happily kill protagonists. Um, so, at this moment, we still have a little bit of hope left before it gets crushed. Sansa's naive hope that the knights and the songs will save the day is not yet frittered away. She still believes in the possibility of goodness, and so does Ned. But soon, Ned will lose his head. Uh, so I think this is as good a place as any to conclude this episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. It is odd that the comments disappeared from the video. Not sure why that is. Uh, Streamlabs is the tool uh, being used here. Um, odd that odd that, that stopped. Perhaps it'll be fixed for the next video. Uh, but we will respond to the uh, to the donation questions and stuff. So Riley Rawr, um, we've responded to his uh, comment, and Noah Warnock says, Hey Swift, I wanted to ask, uh, what new POVs do you want to see in the Winds of Winter? Uh, last night I had I had a dream, it came out, I woke up in pain. Yeah, no, that that sucks. It's 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 better though than dreaming that um the Winds of Winter gets you know cancelled or George Martin dies. That would be uh, really nightmarish. Uh, what new POVs? Uh, well, all right. Well, this chapter makes me feel like I want to get a Varus POV, uh, but I don't expect that that will ever happen. Um, we've already got some interesting POVs in like John Connington and Bar and Barriston are some of the interesting new POVs. Uh, we've already got Ariane. We've already got Iron Islanders. I don't know if they really need to add new POVs at this point. I feel like we've got too much complication as it is. We've got we've got so many POVs in so many different places. Uh, will George Martin need new POVs? Uh, there will be the prologue and epilogue POVs, I suppose. There is talk of uh, Jane Westerling apparently being the POV for the Winds of Winter prologue, uh, which many suspect will lead to Jane's death as uh, prologue characters tend not to have a very long life expectancy. Uh, so a Jane, uh, a Jane POV will be cool, um, even if it ends badly for her. Um, and it'll be interesting to see the other epilogue characters as well. I do like George Martin's tradition of using uh, some fresh new POVs uh, for the prologues and epilogues. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they are. But yeah, mostly I just want to see the fucking story concluded, honestly. Jon Snow as a POV will be interesting after his resurrection. I'm really fond of the idea that, 
uh, John, after his resurrected, uh, after his resurrection, he will be changed fundamentally on the level of like his consciousness, and therefore perhaps will no longer be a POV character um, after after um, after being resurrected. That would be really cool if John becomes a different character in some sense, and that we no longer have direct access to his thoughts. That could be a really unsettling and really interesting thing to do with his character, I think. And some people even speculate that Daenerys won't have POV chapters uh, anymore after a certain point, because we've got, like, Barristan uh, and people like that to keep an eye on her. Uh, And it might be... Daenerys might be an even more interesting... If she slips into being more of an antagonist, it'll be interesting to see her from the outside as opposed from the inside, uh, perhaps. Uh, So, yeah, there's interesting stuff that could go on with the POVs uh, in the new new books. Um, But, yeah, honestly, I think there's so much that can be done with the existing ones. And, and frankly, I'm not sure I want to see the story complicate itself further. Uh, I think those threads need to start be start start getting knotted together as opposed to growing and spreading into more complication. I think that's the only way this story uh, will ever get a conclusion. And I do hope that it gets a conclusion. So thank you all uh, for participating in this live stream. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, we will have another episode uh, when the next episode happens. Um... Go off to the off to the discords and, and to the Facebooks and to all of the groups if you would like to do that. Uh, and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.